Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marissa, she, her pronouns. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, I want to remember, I want to remind everyone that this is a space built on trust and respect. We are here to learn and show solidarity, not to discriminate. We are now going to talk about the ways that the daily stress of being LGBTQ plus in America uniquely affects type one diabetes individuals. Both of our speakers today also have the experience not only of being queer, but of being trans and gender nonconforming, which as we'll talk about in a minute, has implications both medically and, pers and personally. But first, let me introduce you to our panelists. First, we have Quinn Layton, who uses they them pronouns. Uh, Quinn is the Montana Insulin for All chapter leader and was diagnosed with type one diabetes at age three. Being diagnosed so young and living with the disease for 37 years, they don't really remember a time without the daily struggles of type one diabetes. They grew up in a rural state as a queer non-binary person, often hiding diabetes in the background of their other identities. Their advocacy has shown up in several ways, using social media, op-eds, and videos to share their experience from the financial burdens to specific stories about the emotional and physical burden of living with this invisible illness every day. In their spare time, they dabble in photography and enjoy reading, writing, and, per Diana's uh, recent statement, hiking in the incredible outdoors Montana has to offer. It is very green and beautiful. Next, we have Sydney Griffin, who uses they them pronouns also, a non-binary queer person with type 1 diabetes diagnosed in 2013 at 16. After spending time in the professional world, they realized how few disabled folks have a voice, especially when it comes to invisible illnesses. This inspired them to learn and speak out on these issues and how they intersect with being Black and queer. Their, in, their interests lie in race, queer, and disabled disability politics and advocacy. They spend their spare time reading and writing. Sydney hopes to continue to use their Instagram and writing to continue to advocate here as well as learn about these issues. Thank you both for being here. So let's start with a little bit of framing. Um, what is unique to the experience of having type one as an LGBTQ plus person? Uh, Sydney, why don't you go first? Uh, yeah, uh, unique, uh, you know, to having type one and being, uh, you know, LGTB, LG, queer plus, I guess, um, is all the daily struggles of diabetes, um, as well as some of those struggles with being queer as well. Um, general discrimination um, within the people that are supposed to be your community as well. Um, so it kind of, it kind of makes everything a little bit more difficult when you have to worry about your safety um, as far as your health concerns and then your safety as far as uh, being a queer person, being out, how flamboyant you are uh, and things along that line. Quinn? Um, I think many of my comments sort of echo that as well as just sort of the internalization of homophobia and transphobia um, in the broader sense. Um, I also work in the LGBTQ world. Um, so I hear a lot of the, the ways in which um, queer and trans people face discrimination, uh, bias, prejudice in accessing medical care, whether or not they have diabetes. And then just thinking about uh, the local state level and federal level of um, what's going on that affects us and seeing like attack after attack and the way that we internalize that and um, maybe don't take the same level of care for our diabetes and um, can sort of add to uh, more negative health outcomes um, and things like that and maybe not accessing care in the same way that we would if we didn't feel that fear of discrimination or prejudice. Yeah, thank you both. Um, let's get a little bit more specific. Uh, we mentioned earlier that not conforming to gender norms can have medical ramifications. Um, what have your experiences with medical providers been? Um, Quinn, I know you have stories you want to share, so why don't you go first? Uh, I do. Um, so one that I always remember was uh, going to see a new endocrinologist here in Helena and I stepped up to the counter and one of the women was busy like on the phone well, actually I think on her computer and so she asked me to step 
um, to the next receptionist over and she said, and I don't remember that woman's name, but she said, can you help this? And she sort of paused and stuttered. And I had to finish the sentence for her because she, she couldn't figure out my gender, which is what people go to all the time. And so I was like, I'm a, I'm a person. Um, you, I, can you help this person? And so I li literally had to finish the sentence for her. And this happens all the time in a number of settings, like it happened in the grocery store as well. Um, <laughs> this woman couldn't figure, couldn't figure me out. Um, and it's just, I think people just uh, sort of go to this like very binary sense of like where people should be and how they express themselves. And so both in terms of my gender expression and my gender identity, um, I get treated and mistreated in different ways in the medical setting. And so just the fact that I had to like tell her and folks in that medical setting that I'm a person and like you could just refer to me as a person rather than, you know, whatever gender you think I am, um, that'd just be great if you could just call me a person. Um, and then I've had a couple times I uh, recently trying to advocate for changing my name in the medical file. And one was at my endocrinologist's office because they noticed that my pump, they download the pump information and it was under Quinn. And I, so she asked, she said, are you changing, are you going by Quinn now? And I said, yes. And I said, could you change that in your file? And she was like, not until it's legally changed and like walked out of the room. And I was, I was just like, it was like a shot to the gut. Um, I was, it just sort of like reminded me of the very systematized and like colonized way that we have um, our medical system set up and they just, it's very black and white and they weren't willing to make any change, even like a preferred name, you know, instead of calling me by my dead name, like just preferred name or a nickname. Um, and then on the other end of that, I did it with my eye doctor and uh, they do have a way of putting in a preferred name. Um, and then when the nurse told the doctor and he came in the room, he not only was supportive, but he like celebrated it. And he was like, that's so great. Um, he was like, good for you. And um, it was actually, I, you know, he's my favorite doctor, even though he has to often inject steroids into my eye. Um, Cause it's one of, it's like the worst complication of my diabetes is my left eye. But he made a point as well after I, you know, got the injection and was getting ready to leave. And he was like, bye, Quinn. And it was like the most affirming thing that like a medical provider could do. And I just, I wish that there were more ways that medical providers took the steps to support people instead of the burden always being on us. Um, and it's just, I, you, you see it a lot, especially with trans folks. Um, I think that they're more supportive if you bring in like a partner of the same gender, you know, people tend to be more supportive of that. But if you're trans or non-binary, gender non-conforming, just the way that you try to advocate for changes or how you are just treated as a human being um, can be really difficult and just emotionally exhausting. Yeah, that's really powerful. Thanks for sharing. Um, Sydney, uh, why don't you go next? Tell us about your experience in, in medical settings. Yeah, um, so I have known that I've been, you know, queer for a while, um, but recently it just came out as non-binary within the past year. Um, and even with that, I'm not out uh, to my care team. Uh, typically, I have a, enough issues with them as is, unfortunately. Um, and I... I don't feel like advocating for myself in that way is my biggest priority, um, which is kind of a bummer, but being as someone who, uh, you know, presents cis woman, um, and as a fat black person, I run into some issues, you know, in my endo's office with that in itself, and, you know, I feel like just for, for safety and also for my own peace of mind, I kind of have to, uh, you know, pick that battle and think about whether or not that's something I feel like fighting today. Uh, which is the whole issue, right? It shouldn't necessarily be something that I feel like fighting. Um, but I didn't want to add, you know, anything to the list where I can go in there and be treated any kind of way, uh, you know, being Black in Minnesota, uh, you know, having my hair the way it is and, and this, that, and the other. Um, 
you know, like I could throw a dart and kind of pick any of these reasons as to why I'm struggling. So I didn't necessarily want to add that to it. Um, I haven't had any issue. Like my name is still my birth name. Like I've been lucky enough in that regard, but uh, it's really grating to to be misgendered in a space that you have to be um, because I don't even have the not necessarily luxury, but the, the option to not go to my endo's office, um, you know, to maintain prescriptions and just things like that. Um, so in the other hand of that, I have not dealt with any of that, but I guess in not is kind of the issue there as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. Clearly there's still a long ways to go when you can't be your whole self safely, um, including your do in your doctor's office. Um, so on that note, one of the things that we want to highlight both in this session and in the workshop more generally is how we as a community can better show up for each other. Where do you need to, where do you need us to improve our support of you and other LGBTQ plus people with type one? Who wants to go first? I mean, I can go first if you're cool. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, a lot of it is centered around language, because um, I know we, you know, we have online community and things of that nature, and um, we really lean on each other when it comes to those immediate questions and uh, support and things like that. Um, the biggest thing that I've noticed is since uh, getting more into the online community is the way that people um, phrase things and uh, insert gender unnecessarily into it um like i know on instagram and, and twitter and things people do the you know whole ladies uh you know when it's your time of the month how do your blood sugars go and da 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 um and i try and respond to all those people you know like not everyone that has a period identifies as a lady this that and the other thing um in that same vein people do the whole um you know it's summertime how do you wear a pump with a skirt would you put your pump in your bra still again with that ladies piece um, because not everyone that wears a skirt is a lady and not, and they don't identify as such. Um, so it's really hard to see that in the community still being further kind of like pushed to the side and having to, to advocate for yourself in that way. Um, and then I know there's been a lot of issues as far as like reproductive rights and things like that, um, and birth control, you know, and if you're already rationing your insulin and, um, you know, struggling with complications and stuff like that, that could affect your, you know, pregnancy in that whole way too. And the way that birth control with diabetes and with these complications is still framed around this gendered language tends to be, you know, the biggest things that I am seeing within the community um, or people, you know, assuming your gender right off the bat when trying to be your friend, but it still kind of just leaves that negative taste in your mouth where you have to kind of other yourself, you know, from people right off the bat. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's huge. Um, the, me the messaging and the language is, <laughs> I feel like we could talk for hours about that. Um, it's, you know, having gender neutral pronouns that nobody understands um, is really difficult. And I think that, you know, advocating just in general to like friends and family and trying to find that understanding um, can take a little bit of time, but like, in those ways, uh, it definitely, um, you know, you can see, see the change happening, but I have never even tried in a medical setting. I think I brought it up at my eye doctor appointment with him and his nurse because I got such positive feedback when I advocated for my name change. And um, because when, when the doctor came back in, the nurse said, you know, she's changing she she's going by this and I then tried to talk about pronouns but you know I don't even try sometimes because it's just so overwhelming and I you can only advocate for yourself so much before you just want to crawl inside of a hole um and it's largely around the pronouns it's just it's so hard and people like don't understand non-binary language that well because we've been brought up in this world and in this society that focuses on binary gender and gender norms and the way that we should fit inside these boxes and so um, even as a you know 
even before I came out as non-binary, I was a gender non-conforming person. And so I, I did go through a process of changing my pronouns. And, um, but I just think that the way, again, the way that sort of the medical field is set up is um, some clinics and some medical providers are sort of like taking on this role of like trying to get training or reaching out to LGBTQ groups and more specifically trans and non-binary led groups on uh, like trans one-on-one trainings or like how can we modify our intake forms? And I do think that that's a big way that things could be improved. At least for me, like if I was going to a doctor's office and they were like, oh, we just want to make sure like everything's correct and just update your, your intake. And, and there was like a line for chosen name and pronoun, like that would make me feel so much better and more validated and make me feel like they were seeing me as a whole person instead of just looking at my A1C and my pump. Um, because largely I feel like my endocrinologist, even though we, you know, get along fine, he just looks at the numbers and he's just like, oh, I hope you win the lottery soon so you can get this great new pump. Um, and he's just really focused on that. Even one time when I tried, like I was terrified of a low that I had where I honestly felt like I was gonna die. And I tried to tell him about that. And afterwards I was like, do endocrinologists go through any sort of like social worker training because I just didn't like it was the worst response ever and that was about a terrifying low I had and that had nothing to do with my like humanity as a person and so I would like and especially after the conversation with this nurse like I'm literally never having this conversation with their office again but to Sydney's point like he's the only one in the town I live in I have to go back and see him he refills my prescriptions I have, like, I need to make sure that my, like, I'm doing okay. And, and this is the price we pay is like, they're not gonna, they're gonna use my dead name and they're gonna misgender me every single time. And it sucks. So as much like sort of advocacy around like working with medical providers and clinics, especially like the big clinics that have like all the individual doctors under like a hospital and working to modify uh, the way that they're like talking to patients and asking these questions. Um, it, you know, I think it seems like a little thing to people who aren't affected by it. Um, and it is a way that people can show up for LGBTQ people. But I also think that um, if you're not impacted by it, like leaning on LGBTQ people and, and making sure that this is um, the, the leadership that they would like to see, you know, because like we know what's best for us. So don't like go making changes and patting yourself on the back for, for doing things that make you feel good <laughs> about doing something for us. So those are a few of my thoughts. And again, I'm sorry, I get a little like, Ugh rubbed up um it's, it's worth that. revving about i would say um so so one of the sort of key takeaways that i'm hearing is um that this people should uh be vocal to their doctors about including um more inclusive language in their intake forms and in their processes so that it's not always on the backs of the trans and gender non-conforming people to do it for themselves. Um, I also just wanted to sort of note that in, um, in conversations that we had sort of before this um, in, in preparation, a couple of things came up that I wanted to, that I found really sort of like powerful to hear about. And so I wanted to just kind of like flag and make sure that we get, that they get spoken here too, um, while we have others in the room. Um, and one of them is, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about um, inclusive language, but, um, and that part of that is like how you talk about um, different types of care and different uh, sort of like problems that might manifest in your health. But part of that also is in thinking about how and when you invite people into spaces yeah. and making sure that the spaces that you are inviting people in are actually for them. So if you are going to invite a trans person or a gender non-conforming person to a women's space or a male space to make sure that that is actually a space that they will feel welcome in and is 
actually a safe space for them to be in. Um, don't know if either of you want to actually add to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I know, I know there are a lot of, um, I guess, smaller groups kind of branching off within the diabetic community um, now to kind of like, you know, highlight these specific issues and find uh, solidarity within the solidarity, which I think is super great. Um, but I think it's really important to note that not every space is for someone who um, looks like someone, you know, just, you know, to be like what you said, uh, there have been women spaces that I've been invited to. Um, and it's really still that lonely feeling of having to tell someone like, no, I actually don't belong here. Um, you know, thank you for that. And I've, you know, had people kind of push back and be like, no, like, it's okay. And, you know, da, 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 and things like that. And it's like, well, I, if it says girl in the title, you know, this like little club that I don't want to be in it because I don't want to feed into that misconception that you can kind of move me here or wherever on the scale. Um, you know, and I don't want to be there as your token kind of like girl-esque figure. Um, because it, it just ends up making me feel bad and I know you're trying to be helpful, but um, I find myself kind of, you know, what Quinn said, having to push back on people who are well-meaning, um, but it would be even better, if, you know, on the front end, we <laughs> could stop this before it turns up to be something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, this is a big one for me. I've seen it a lot um, on different platforms and actually found a really a pretty good article on it as well, but I see it. So I'm pretty, I'm fairly politically engaged locally in Montana. And so I see it a lot around elections where there have like women for, you know, this candidate and even folks who know that I identify as non-binary still invite me to those groups. And I saw a good article both on LinkedIn and Facebook going around that talks about like the dangers and harm of like clumping groups together without like thoughtful and intentional um, efforts around like what that means. Um, and for, for me, it's um, I think because I was assigned female at birth, people still think of me as a woman um, and, and these are, you know, in my mind, like well-intentioned allies who aren't like thinking it through and don't realize that when they send that invitation, it's actually like a, again, like this small, like punch to my gut where I'm like, no, no, like, ugh, it pains me. And, um, and it also doesn't invite, like, are you inviting non-binary um, femme people? Um, so somebody that doesn't look like me, but is also non-binary, uh, because I, I doubt that you are. And also, like, does your woman's group, um, is it fully inclusive of trans women? Um, and so it's just like re being really, really careful and thoughtful about, like, how you're setting up these really specific groups. Um, and, and just thinking about that inclusive nature and, like, how you're doing it. And... Um, and yes, it takes some some thought, but also it it can be as simple as just reaching out to different groups of folks and and asking for like a little bit of insight on on how you do that because uh, you know some women's groups are great and some of them are just real real bad and they don't think that trans women are women and uh, that's just really dangerous and harmful to the movement. Indeed. And the world writ large. For sure. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, we're going to take uh, questions from the audience for, in a second. Um, another quick reminder that we will not tolerate discrimination, but feel free to um, add your questions. Um, but before you do, what is the main thing that you hope people take away from this conversation? Um, I think for me, I think I said, I'm, I said some of it just sort of around like how the burden, it, it always feels like a burden on us to make these changes. 
and that many medical settings are just always focused on just on your specific care and like what's going on with your diabetes um, and don't often like think about everything else about who you are as a person. Um, and so I think that there's that, but I, for me, I think, and this is in part because of the work I do um, during the day <laughs> um, is recognizing like we know that living with diabetes is difficult to say the least. There are so many challenges. We have to think about it every second of every day. Like we're constantly checking our blood sugar. You have to think about it before you exercise, before you eat something. Um, so there's all of those and like, how are we able to financially stay alive? Um, and then what I would also like people to, to know and think about is LGBTQ people are disproportionately impacted by just about every issue. Um, I have done a lot of work on LGBTQ youth homelessness. Um, there is a very high rate of homelessness among youth and young adults and transgender people. Um, I actually was at a conference and I saw a sign on the ground that said homeless and diabetic, please help. And it like broke my heart. And I was like frantically running around downtown Chicago, which I was completely unfamiliar with, like trying to find this person. Um, and also very high rates of violence um, in many places. There is essentially like a patchwork system of um, protections for discrimination. Like in many ways, it, it could be a perceived threat, but also um, queer and trans people can be denied service. So a physician could say, I don't want to serve you, or I don't want to provide services to you because I don't like that you're trans. And so these are things that can happen. And so sometimes it's like we get tired of being treated like crap. And so we don't want to go back to that doctor, which can be really dangerous. But in other ways, like they could simply not provide services depending on where you live. Um, and depending, you know, Montana is a huge state, much of it very rural, um, and it, it could be very dangerous. So I think just thinking about like both of those and how they individually, they're both very difficult, but like together, thinking about how that manifests into how we can create healthier outcomes um, to try to support um, both of those. So I think that's my, sorry, long-winded response. Okay. <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, what I'm, you know, hoping folks take away is, uh, even though there's plenty of stuff that makes us similar and the same, um, there's a lot that makes us different, even if um, just the few things mentioned here. Um, and remen remember, I guess, how you feel uh, talking to your maybe non-diabetic friends and family and things, um, and how frustrating it is to have them constantly kind of, you know, maybe belittle what you're going through or not completely understand it. Um, or even, you know, I know like part of my frustration was I had to keep telling people I ate with to say food wrappers um, who weren't super familiar with diabetes, right? And it just not being the biggest deal, but if you keep going through it and you keep going through it, um, you know, you bring that up, makes them uncomfortable. Um, you know, if they cook for you, then you have to kind of take care of them and make them feel better. It's like, it's, it's very similar in that same vein. Um, and both of these things can be, you know, life-threatening. Um, so there's plenty that makes us similar, but enough that, that makes us different where I might need, you know, different or, or certain accommodations than you do. Um, and it would be nice to not have to bring it up, have to get misgendered. You know, I end up feeling bad. I have to take care of you. You apologize. Because a lot of um, people, when they misgender, you do the very dramatic uh, they either don't care or they do the like, I'm such a horrible person, please never speak to me again, you know, da 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 da, and like it turns into a whole thing where it's like, you know what, maybe I just, you know, shouldn't do that. So, um, I guess just, I don't know, take a second, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not that hard, um, <laughs> but it ends up like sticking with you more than, than speak, sticking with us more than, you know, like Quinn said, um, it feels terrible and it makes you feel super invalid. Um, in a space that you're supposed to belong, you know, right? Yeah, and when people like overly apologize about misgendering you, then to Sydney's point, then it it almost makes 
you, like us look like the bad guy mm -hmm. for like correcting somebody right. or at, just asking them to use the right pronoun. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's putting the burden back on yeah. you. Yeah. Um, thank you both so much. We've gotten some like really great uh, questions in the chat and um, fortunately we have some time to answer them. Um, so I'm just gonna do these in the order that they, that they came in. Um, the first one is a lot of queer people express a form of body dysmorphia related to their gender or gender expression. Also, a lot of diabetic people have their own complicated relationships with their bodies. Do you find that your relationship with your body is compounded by your diabetic status and your queerness? How does that manifest to you? And how have you learned to cope, for lack of a better word? Learning to love your body is a tough journey for everyone. Right. Um, I know at least for me, um, like I've been experiencing a lot of dysmorphia, but when I can do well, like with my diabetes and stay in range, that kind of makes me feel like my body's doing something right. Um, at least even just structurally and like, you know, hey, maybe I'll, right, I'm not like staying alive, I'm doing the, the things. Um, so it tends to make me feel better in the ways that I can't necessarily fix um, because I feel like very firmly in being non-binary in some days um, I want to look like this and some days I want to look like that. Um, and I can't achieve that even if I did have all the necessary resources <laughs> because it goes back and forth so much. Um, so I think even though diabetes is a pain when I see like, oh, I've been in range for, you know, 10, 12 hours, whatever it is, it's kind of like a little pat on the back um, in that way, you know, like the body's not completely useless. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely have and do experience uh, body dysmorphia with being non-binary um, and transmasculine. I, my, I don't feel like I experience as many like body issues with my diabetes as much as I feel like I don't have any control. Like I feel like my diabetes controls my life. <laughs> and um, so I'll sort of compare it that way. In many ways I feel like I don't have a lot of control over my life because of living with diabetes. And then also as a queer and non-binary person, I feel like I can't control the way people treat me and I can't control the ways that lawmakers and um, just sort of like the socio-political landscape is going to treat me. And so like on any given day, I could have a transphobic slur shouted at me on the street. And so in those ways, they sort of coalesce and the way that I have dealt with that is I, I try to focus on the things that I can control. So I try to cook healthy meals, although that has definitely ebbed and flowed during the pandemic. Um, but I try to cook healthy meals. Um, I try to exercise regularly and I am a prolific like cleaner. I like to clean the kitchen. I do the laundry. So it's like as much as I can control like the house, um, those are the ways that I sort of deal with it. Cause I'm like, I can't control all this other stuff. And if I focus too much on that, then the, the rest of it is lost. So. That's, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, I want, I'm going a little bit out of order, but I just wanted to say, we got one comment in the chats um, from somebody who said that, I just wanted to say that as a non-binary queer person, I really appreciate both of you speaking. And I, I know, I just wanted to make sure that you both heard that before we, before we left. Um, so next question. How would y'all like to see the insulin for all spaces in addition to that already mentioned to make it clear that LGBTQ plus community members are not only welcome, but desired? Specifically, what is missing from these spaces at this moment and how can we be better allies to the people with diabetes and LGBTQ plus community? Sometimes it feels still like very like tokeny like there's always the big hullabaloo during like pride in, in, you know, when like legislation is passed. Um, so it'd be very nice if it could become just very, uh, you know, streamlined into the normal where you, everyone kind of has that seat at the table. There wouldn't necessarily need to be a, a large push to incorporate queer people because they're already there. Um, and I feel like that's part of the issue is that th there are so often times like we're looking for queer people. We're looking to do this and to help. And it's like, you already should, you know, and then it's what July 1st 
and then the rainbows go away and then everything is you know back to the way it was um you know so uh normalize it right like don't make it uh, i don't want to say don't make it a big deal but kind of right um yeah i mean tokenization is always a thing that we need to be discussing but um i think for me i think I mean, this would be a bold action, but like taking it on as like part of the programming of the insulin for all work that T1 um, International does is like sort of, because there's so many pieces to it. Like I said, like there's so many different like um, ways that people are disproportionately impacted and um, visibility and representation is important. And so, um, that would be mine is like being able to talk about it more and um, elevating LGBTQ voices of people who are living with type one diabetes and type two diabetes. And um, so, I mean, like I said, it's kind of a big step and uh, you know, oh, <laughs> having like a, a program takes money, I know, but yeah, that, that would be mine. Um, but just being able to talk about it more, elevating issues. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm now I'm trying to figure out what, what our fun last question should be because um, we have a whole bunch of good ones. Um, but we only I think I think we only have time for one more. Um, so here's one. Um, Quinn, you mentioned trans 101 trainings and things like that. I'm wondering what both of you think would be important in provider edu education, either medical school or continuing education to make healthcare spaces more inclusive and safer? We'll end with a big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, medical providers are also people, you know, who all come with their own bias, their own implicit bias. Um, and so part of that is just, you know, can't be helped. Um, but I think, I mean, ideally it'd be wonderful if there was some specific training that they went through in order to become a medical provider, <laughs> um, like really specific to working with LGBTQ people um, and specifically like trans and non-binary people. Um, but I also think that there are a lot of organizations that focus and specialize in this area. And so I'm sure there are organizations in every state that could work with um, like insulin for all chapters and work with medical clinics, physicians um, on doing that training, or even just consulting with them on intake forms and things like that. Like I've actually gotten, I get those asked sometimes and then I refer them out to our community partners or I simply say like, these are some great ways that you could add, um, help people feel more valued and affirmed if you add like um, more than two genders <laughs> on the form. And so I think, um, you know, because adding a whole new training aspect for medical providers is no small feat. Um, and so a lot of this, you know, systemic change we know is not easy or quick. So, um, but I do think like folks reaching out to local LGBTQ groups in their areas or, as, and specifically if there's a one that focuses on trans issues, um, I think that that could be one way to try to get the ball rolling and see, I, in Montana, there are more folks who want this training, um, you know, some, don't care to get it, but there are some who are like, I just don't know how to, to uh, provide the right treatments to um, transgender people. It's not that I don't want to, I just, I don't want to do it wrong. So. Um, I, think, I think for me, um, I noticed a very drastic um, difference in the care I received with my pediatric endo um, to my adult endo and even my pediatric endo being having her own issues. Um, I feel like, at least for me, you know, I don't know if anyone can echo this, um, like what, as soon as you make that switch, um, like Quinn was saying, the care is very much about your numbers, about your, you know, your pump, about your this. 
Um, and there's not necessarily that connection made between patient and doctor. And it sounds really cheesy in that way, but I feel like, um, like even like the best teachers know their students and that kind of cuts down on the, um, the issues and the, the possibilities of misgendering. And, and I would, every person that I have come out to and every person that knows my pronouns and things like that, you know, is a friend or someone I trust. And obviously I'm not trying to BFF with my doctor. Um, but if I, if I felt like I wasn't going to get turned away or, um, you know, laughed at or even told no, you know, even like what Quinn said, then I'd be more apt to do it. Um, and I think you need to build that relationship with your patients and earn that trust which once again is not an easy thing to do if you see, you know, if you're a large practice or whatever it is. Um, but I've had doctors introduce themselves to me each time that I see them, you know, when it's like, I know who you, who you are. I feel like a, a simple glance in my chart could tell you who I am. Um, you know, things like that, where it's like, okay, so you don't even, not that you don't recognize me, you don't know me, you didn't look ahead of time. Why would I waste my time trying to, you know, come out or be like this, that, and the other kind of whatever it is. Um, so yeah, like people are not making people feel comfortable. Um, you know, I think that's part of it on a smaller scale would be a little easier, you know? Yeah. Um, we have, we have three more minutes, so I'm going to take it back and do one more question, um, which is, a, I think a nice little closing out question, which is, um, how did you get started each of you with your activism work and how do you incorporate LGBT and diabetes activism? together um well i know for me uh i i think and you know quinn stop me if i'm overstepping i feel like when you are a part of a you know quote marginalized group uh and as soon as you kind of hit that like oh i know um you always try and incorporate that you know into your day-to-day and you have really no other choice but to advocate i mean you do but you know like the the right choice right so um obviously being black my whole life was part of it and then um you know identifying as queer and then formerly uh seeing myself as a woman you kind of hit all those uh groups that are suffering in kind of the the underrepresented um and then that kind of snowballs and transitions and then you get like another one and that's diabetes and then it becomes just so much day to day um and i think being vocal i think being vocal is advocacy in itself um you know like living your truth and just telling people like hey i don't want to be called that um and standing up for yourself is is part of it you don't even necessarily need to do the whole get on this platform and do this that and the other um so i think you know living your truth and then reading learning meeting people um it kind of it it, it fits together in a good way it, it'll happen i feel like it's not as big of a search and find thing as folks make it out to be um quinn i don't know if you'd say the same no i uh I agree. I mean, I think I joke with people that I feel like a walking coming out poster um, that like people aren't going to see me and think I'm straight (laughs) or like married to a man. Um, So, I mean, a lot of my queer advocacy, despite the job I have, um, is because I am who I am. And you know, even my past employment ex- experience, I've always just wanted to do work that felt rewarding and fulfilling and like trying to right a wrong. Um, and so I think, and a- especially as issues impact me as a person, that's kind of when it propels me even more. And I, I definitely um, don't, don't hide that I have uh, diabetic privilege. Like I, my employer provides great health insurance and I have a pump and my care is manageable. Um, but I think that, um, that's also when, when you do have privilege, it's also just even more important that you use that to advocate for folks who might not, um, be able to advocate for themselves. And so, or feel safe to do so. So I, um, you know, I've been doing LGBTQ advocacy for 10 years and um, diabetes advocacy, probably five to seven years in different forms, Um, whether it was sharing my story, um, doing it, you know, (laughs) doing it for um, political advocacy. I'm often leaned on for um, 
doing a message for candidates and things like that. But um, yeah, just sort of in different ways. And then, um, you know, obviously understanding that um, just sort of the intersections of how all of these identities um, overlap and, and how the barriers to economic self-sufficiency is just uh, really important and you need to be talking about all of that and I, I think about this a lot just sort of in my day job where it's just it gets really exhausting having to constantly justify our humanity in fighting bad bills and I think about that with this work too where it's like we have to justify that we deserve affordable insulin and like what would the world look like if both as a queer and trans person and somebody living with diabetes what if we could just pay ten dollars for a vial of insulin and people didn't try to discriminate against us and we could like celebrate our humanity right across the board like what if that were our reality and so that's why i think it's so important to advocate and fight for what's right and what we just deserve as people. Yeah, um, I think that's the world that we are all hoping for. So uh, that's all we have time for today. Thanks to everyone for joining us, for submitting questions and talking about how we should, can all show up to each other. And a special thanks to Quinn and Sydney for offering their voices, their time and their vulnerability. We appreciate both of you. Uh, thanks again. Bye.